We hope and pray you've had a wonderful week this week. And uh, it's a little different today, a little warmer today. We knew that it was going to be warm. We thank the Lord for it. So we've got a few easy ups here. Just come and grab you a seat. It's real nice. The wind's blowing. It feels good underneath there. Uh, I was ready to just go take me a nap. Better not do that. We're going to open up a little bit of worship today with Old Church Choir. Y'all ready, guys? One, two, three, four.
come. All God's people say it. Amen. Amen.
Father God, we thank you. Thank you that you allowed Jesus to go to an order to cross, to give his life in our place so that we could be redeemed, so that we could come back to the cross and we can ask forgiveness. And you'll grant it and you'll give us salvation. Father, I pray today that you'll speak to us and challenge us in all that we do. I thank you for each person that is here today. God, I ask you to bless them in a special way. Lord, speak to us through your word. Give us wisdom, give us clarity in all that we do and all that we say as we honor and lift up the name of Jesus. God, I just ask that you'd hide me behind the cross. Help me to be what you'd have me to be and share the message that you've laid upon my heart. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here again. I hope everybody is doing well. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Jonah. We'll get there eventually. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening right now, a lot of things that are happening in our world uh, that are controversial, that are tough. A lot of people are going through difficult times. A lot of people are going through sickness. A lot of people are going through sadness. A lot of people have lost jobs. A tremendous amount of uncertainty. The amazing thing is, is nothing caught God by surprise. And uh, he loves us in spite of who we are. And I think one of the greatest things that could happen, one of the greatest things that could transpire through this coronavirus would be that revival break out in God's church. I believe it's something that God desires. It's something that's needed. It's something that, that should take place, but maybe we're not ready for it. Maybe God has used this time where we have come back to Him, where we have trusted Him, where maybe we were in a different state of mind because we were so busy with the things of this world, and now we've been able to slow down and realize that God's in control of all things. And maybe through this time, God just desires to do a work in His church. You see, in America today, we're a nation that practices many anti-God and anti-Bible lifestyles, from homosexuality being an alternative lifestyle, to abortion being a choice of a mother and not the unborn child, to drugs and alcohol being an acceptable way of life, to people who live together and have children before and outside of marriage, and I hear the analogy so many times, I wouldn't buy a car without test driving it. And to that I say, I hope your spouse is more precious than a car, but if not, who's not to say that you'll trade them in for a different model with the same problems? And people who would rather allow someone else to keep them up rather than earning an honest day's wage for an honest day's work. You see, America is so far from what America began to be years and years ago. And maybe God is using this time as a wake-up call for the church and a wake-up call for America to repent and come back to what He's called us to be before He does something to us. We're so far removed from the Judeo-Christian values in which we were founded upon. We look more like Sodom and Gomorrah today, maybe even worse than the Christian nation that America has always been known as. Do you realize that people in other nations are sending more missionaries to the United States of America than America is sending out? Do you realize how far we have digressed from the truth of what God's Word is? And listen, it's not America's fault, it's the church. The church's responsibility to be proclaiming the gospel. The church's responsibility to be loving lost people. The church's responsibility to be living a life when people look at it and say, you know what, there's something different about them. I want that. I desire that. I need that in my life. Realize that there are 21 different major religions that are practiced in the United States of America. And there's also over 10,000 religions in America that have over a thousand different followers. What this nation and world needs is revival. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a fallen away comes first. And then the man of sin is revealed in the son of perdition. Therefore, the world in which we're living in, the America in which we see today, it should be expected. But there's no place in God's word where it says that revival cannot happen and should not happen. And I think that we as the church need to fall on our faces before a holy God and repent and turn back to him before it is everlastingly too late. 
We need to be concerned with the lost people, so much concerned that we can't rest at night because we're worried about where they're going to spend eternity. When's the last time that you stayed up all night and prayed for the soul of somebody that you knew was lost? Not for the soul of somebody that you thought was in an accident or somebody that was sick or somebody that was going through a troubled time, but somebody who was lost. And it bothered you so much that you didn't get rest because you loved that person and you wanted to see them in heaven. You see, we need to be compelled to come back to Jesus, and we need to be compelled as the church to repent on a daily basis, not something that happens every now and then. Revival needs to take place in the American church, in the church of uh, Jesus Christ across the world. So where does revival begin? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. If you have your Bibles in Jonah chapter 1, we'll look at it. We'll look at a lot of scripture today, but hopefully I can read fast and you can listen quicker. How's that? The Bible says in verse 1 of Jonah, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose and fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship that was going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went down onto it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let me just tell you, finish up the story. He gets on the boat right there. He goes down. There's a big, uh, God produces a wind that comes against that boat. That boat doesn't sail. It starts taking on water that it should sink. Jonah's asleep in the bottom of a boat. They finally wake him up and say, man, call on your God. Jonah said, I don't need to call on my God. I know what the problem is. It's me Throw me overboard. No, we're not going to do that. They throw cargo. Finally, they throw Jonah overboard. And in verse 17, we're going to pick up there in chapter 1. Actually, in verse 15, it says, So they picked up Jonah, and they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, and he said, I cried out to you, O Lord, because of my afflictions. And he said to me, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and the, all the billows of your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have never been cast from your side. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. And when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercies. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah on the dry, like dry ground. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came again to Jonah a second time. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message which I tell you. And Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city the first day's walk, and then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And then the word came to the king of, the, of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid aside his, rose, his robe, and he's covered his head with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. Look at verse number 9. <coughs> Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? And then the Lord saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Father, we thank you for the truth of the reading of your word. And God, I pray today that revival starts that the revival starts in me, that it starts in each and every person that here today, Lord, that revival starts in your church, God, that you bring revival to us individually, personally, so that we can share it with those around us. 
Lord, I pray that you hide me behind the cross. And I pray, Lord, for the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart to be acceptable to you, O oh God, for it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for honoring God's word. So where does revival start? Well, I'm glad you asked. Revival starts when the believer, when the believer remembers the Lord. You see, here in chapter 2, as my Bible has flipped a few pages, in verse number 7, Jonah's in the belly of a fish. He's crying out to God. And in verse number 7, it says, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. You see, when we remember the Lord, revival can start in our life. And he says, and my prayers went up into your holy temple. You see, you look at everything that Jonah had gone through. He, was, he had gotten a message from God. I want you to go and I want you to preach. And he disobeyed that message. And through that, God took him to the woodshed. You want to see what a woodshed looks like? Look at Jonah's life. Jonah, in his disobedience as a messenger of God, decided he was going to do his own thing. You know why? He didn't like God's call. He didn't like the Ninevites. He didn't want to go in that direction. He wanted to do his own thing. And God said, okay, old boy, I'll let you do your own thing. But guess what? It's not going to be fun along the way. You can do your own thing as a child of God, but it's not going to be pleasing to God and it's not going to be pleasing to you. I can guarantee you that because God loves you. And the Bible says the ones who God loves, he chastens. He brings us back to him some way, shape, or form because of his great love for us. You see, Jonah jumped on that boat, and in that boat he said, I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to forget about God. I'm going to forget about Nineveh. And God created a wind that came against the boat, and he was about to sink. And they found him asleep and woke him up and said, cry out to your God. He's like, man, there's no need to. My God's the reason all this is happening. No, no, no. Throw me overboard. No, no. We're going to loosen the cargo. We're going to throw everything in. We don't want anybody to perish. If you'll throw me overboard, the wind will stop. And that's exactly what happened. You see, Jonah remembered God. He remembered what happened. He remembered who God was. He was thrown overboard, and he spent three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. I don't know about you, but I don't think fish acid's what I want to kind of cleanse me and give me that new youthful look. Could you imagine what Jonah looked like as he had gone through the digestive juices of a fish, as he had seaweed on his hair, as he was sloshed around in the bottom in the belly of that fish? He probably had other fish in there with him because it had to eat something other than Jonah. Probably some other fish bones, probably some other things in there, and he's in there sloshing around and going as deep as that fish wants to go and as high as that fish wants to go and everywhere. And he's there and he's in misery. But he remembered God. You see, the believer who wants revival to start in their life has to remember the Lord. We have to remember what God has done in our past. He has given us salvation. He has given us provisions. He has given us protection. He has been there to bless us through it all. But so many times we get so high and mighty and say, God, you didn't do this. I did this. Talking to a gentleman just a, a few minutes ago, asking him how his business was. And he said, you know what? It's not my business. It's God's business. I just get the privilege of working for the Lord. And I'm blessed. I've got everybody back and we're working. And God has provided in such an amazing way. You see, when we realize that God's in control of it all, that he owns it all, it makes life a whole lot more easy. We've got to remember what God has done in the past, but we also got to remember what God can do right now. You see, God wants to change you. He wants to use you. He wants to change me. He wants to use me. He wants revival in His church. And listen, church is not this building. Church is the people who know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Church is you if you've been born again. You are the church. The bride of Christ. And God wants revival to happen in you. How does it happen? It happens when you remember that God can do a work in you right now. He can save you and He can save others as you live your life for Him. He is providing for you right now. He is giving you the breath of life. He's allowing you to enjoy the beautiful sunshine. He's giving you vitamin D through that sun. What an amazing thing, something our body needs. He's giving you the health and strength and the right mind to come and to worship Him. God is doing all that right now. And then we also need to remember what God can do in the future. You see, one of these days, God's going to take us home to live for Him. Whether we don't have to worry about the penalty and the pain and the suffering of sin and everything that goes on in this world. 
You see, God has a great and amazing plan for everybody who is his child. And it's to be able to spend eternity in heaven with him. And I don't know about you, but I would, I'm looking more forward to heaven than living right here now. And every day that goes by, I long for heaven a little bit more because this old world's nasty. And so for revival to start in the believer, we have to remember the Lord. But not only that, listen to me very carefully. For revival to start in the believer, we have to obey the call of God. Do you realize that God has called everyone? That God goes out and he speaks to people by name. And the first thing that he says is, you know what, I want you to follow me. When Jesus was walking on the shores of Galilee, he saw Andrew and he saw Peter and he said, Hey guys, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He came on down, he saw James and John, he said, Follow me and I'll bless you, I'll make you fishers of men. And he went to, to, to eight other guys and told them to follow him and they were going to be his disciples and they followed him. And the other people, he said, Follow me and they said, You know what? I ain't got time for that. But we need to be obedient to the call of God. For those of us who know Jesus Christ, believers need to be obedient to the call of God. Here, all of a sudden, Jonah said, no, God, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. God took him to the woodshed, and guess what? He's like, I don't like that experience. God, it's time to do it your way. I'm willing to do whatever it is, God, that you would have me to do. In chapter 3 right there in Jonah, we see what happens. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Listen to me. When God has a call on your life, and if you're a child of his, he has a call on your life. He has a specific thing that he wants you to do to bring glory and honor to him and to reach lost people. And he doesn't change that call. Do you see? It didn't say, well, well okay, since Jonah's not going to be obedient, I'm going to go to somebody else and have them preach to Nineveh. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, listen to this message, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Hmm. It's interesting. In chapter 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Boy, God's message is pretty plain, and it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It doesn't change. And for revival to start in a believer's heart, guess what? We need to obey the call. Listen to me very carefully. It's not the length of the message that's preached. It's the power in which it's preached in. If it's the Word of God, the Bible says it will never come back void. That it goes forth and it proclaims and it accomplishes that which God would have it to accomplish. It. You see, the amazing thing is it's not about the length or the breadth or the width of the message. It's about the accuracy of the message. And we see here that Jonah's message was not very long. It was not very long. It was an eight-word eight message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Boy, I'd love to be able to preach that every Sunday. It'd be quick, wouldn't it? Y'all like that. Here's your message for the day. Boom, let's go. But see, the people of Nineveh knew that God was real. And they knew that their sin was real. And they knew that they had angered God. And they feared the Lord. Why? Because they heard the accuracy of the message from God's messenger. Revival will never be transferred to others until we experience it personally. Did you hear me? Revival will never be shared with the lost and dying world until it first happens in your life. Nothing can happen through us until we first, until it first happens to us. Jonah experienced revival. He was in the belly of a fish and he realized, you know what, God, I've been disobedient to you and I apologize for that. God, not only do I apologize, I repent and I want to be made right with you. And so God heard and saw his repentance. He restored him. He reconciled him. And then he commissioned him to go out and to share the gospel. Nineveh experienced the same exact revival that Jonah experienced. Why? Because Jonah had experienced and now the people could. You see, when we experience revival personally, other people can experience what's going on in our lives. The problem is, some of us are holding on to something that we did a long time ago. And listen to me very carefully, God never had any part of it. I don't mean to be upset and I don't mean to tell you the truth. Yeah, I do. I want to be honest with God. But there's a lot of people walking around here walking around in a lie because of something you did that God had nothing to do with. 
God desires to save you, and you you put all these conditions. God, I'll let you save me if. No, it don't work that way. God, here's my life. I come before you, a broken person, and I, I'm asking you to forgive me, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to repent and turn my life over to you. You take me, you do with me whatever you want to, and then God can do his part. But the problem is we think it's all about us, and we think we're the ones in control of our salvation. We have no salvation apart from God. Jonah was able to experience revival, and therefore Nineveh was able to experience revival. God's call, God's call for revival today is for the believer to repent and live a surrendered life to Jesus Christ as unto the Lord every day. Surrendered as unto the Lord Jesus every day. Our lives should look a little bit more like Jesus each and every day. And if not, guess what? We need to repent. Third point, we're almost finished. Revival starts when God has the freedom to change heart. Did you hear me? Revival will only start when you say, okay, God, I'm tired of making a mess. I'm tired of being in control. I surrender to your will. Isn't it amazing the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I want your will to be perfect on earth, but not in my life. Doesn't work that way. God, I surrender to your will. And when we begin to give God the freedom to change our heart, revival can take place. Why? Because repentance has taken place. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, it says, And Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of a fish. And in verse number 9, But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation it's not of Jonah. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah repented. He got right and said, Here, God, here's my life. I made a mess of it. I'm giving it back to you to do whatever it is that you choose to do with it. Jonah repented and God caused revival to start in his heart. Look at what happened to the people of Nineveh in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. What does the scripture say right there? It says this. It says, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed the fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose and came to, the, to his throne, and he laid aside his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. In verse number 10, then God saw their works. God saw that there was a changed life. God saw repentance take place. God saw their works, that they turned. You see that word, repent, right there it is. They turned from their wicked way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And guess what? Revival happened to the people of Nineveh. They were revived, they were reconciled, they were restored back for God. If you want to see change in your world, listen to me very carefully. Let the world see change in you. Did you hear that? If you want to see change in your world, let the world see the change in you. A lot of people say, you know what, I want my kids, whether they're adult children or whether they're young children, or it doesn't matter, guess what? If you're a mom and daddy and you're still alive, they're your children until you die, right? How many of y'all agree with that statement? Those of you, yeah, that's right. And you want to see God work in your children's lives. And you want to see God transform them. And you want to see God do some amazing things in them. You want to raise them in the way of the Lord. Then listen to me, you start living in the way of the Lord. They'll listen to your little mini sermons, but they're really looking at how you live your life to see if there's change, to see if it's real. You, tell, you think about that coworker, you think about that family member, you think about that friend that you want to share Jesus Christ with. You don't want to see them die and go to hell. You want them to come to know Jesus Christ. Then are you modeling the life that surrendered to Jesus Christ right before them? The life that you're living in front of them, can they see that Jesus is Lord, that he's in control, and that he's not only worth living for, but he's worth dying for? See, some things are called, and some things are taught. And for many of us, we need to live it for the world to see it. Charles Spurgeon, I think, was one that was given credit that we need to, to preach the gospel. Preach it loud, please preach it clear, and when necessary. When necessary, use words. Our lives should show 
the world that Jesus Christ is Lord, that without a shadow of a doubt that he's in control, that he has changed us. And when the world sees that repentance, then the world can come and repent as well. Are you ready for the world to change around you? Or are you ready to be a world changer? You see, so many of us are like, Lord, I wish you'd do a great and amazing work in the people around me. But guess what? God wants to do a great and amazing work in you so that he can change the world around you. You need to be that world changer. God desires revival from his church. God desires revival from you and from me. Revival takes place when we repent. When we repent. Lost people, revival can take place when you repent and realize, I don't know Jesus Christ. I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. But I know that I'm lost and I know that I need to be forgiven. And Jesus died for that. And God, I come to you and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I'm giving you my life to take and do whatever you want to. Help me to serve you. You see, that's repentance and revival will come to that lost soul. God wants his church to repent, to tell the lost and dying world of how Jesus died to save them. God wants his church to live what we say that we believe. God don't want us to be hypocrites. He don't want us to be Pharisees. He wants us to be people of truth and people of character, people in whom he is Lord and God. I believe that everyone here today, everyone here today, needs to repent. I believe that everyone here today needs a lifestyle change, which is repentance. Church, do you want to see revival today? Do you really want to see God move? It starts with you and it starts with me. It starts individually. It starts with a personal desire to be made right before God through repentance. So I ask you, church, are you willing for God to bring forth revival? Because it starts with us. It starts with us when we fall down on our face and say, God, forgive me. Change me. Turn me away from me to you. There's a lost and dying world out there. There's a hurting world out there who's looking for truth, who's looking for answers. And they should find those answers in the church. Are we living what we believe? I invite you today to come. We don't have social distancing issues. We got plenty of six feeders up here. I invite you to come and repent and say, God, I'm tired. I'm tired of being in control. I want personal revival because there's people's lives that I want to touch. I want the church to move forward in me. I invite you to come. I'm going to ask the praise band if they'll come up and play a song, and I invite you to come. I invite you to do business with God. If you want to see revival take place, it don't happen because of a group of meetings. It don't happen because some preacher gets up and preaches. Revival happens when God's church falls on their face and repents before Him, and He makes a change in them. Father, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy and Your grace. And God, we just ask You today to move amongst the people that are here and those that may be on Facebook. We pray and ask, Lord, that you will move in such a way that hearts are transformed, that lives are changed, that we turn from our sin and our wicked ways in ourselves. And God, we repent and we come back to you because we want purity, because we want holiness, because we want righteousness in our lives. God, we want revival today. And we know that it starts with us individually, personally. And so, Father, I pray right now, as your Holy Spirit is convicting hearts, I know it's a lot to ask people to get up and come out of the shade and even move and say, here I am, Lord. Because somebody's going to look at them and say, wow, I wonder what's going on in their life. If that's our mindset, God, we're the first one that needs to be praying to you. Lord, I pray that you'd change us today. Pray that you'd change our thought process, you'd change everything about us, God, that you'd help us to surrender and yield to your Lordship and your will. Lord, have you will in your way in this time of invitation as we surrender and give it all to you. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. If you're there and God has spoken to you, are you bold enough to get out of your car? Are you bold enough to get out of your seat? Are you bold enough to say, you know what, God, that's me. I'm coming to repent because I want revival to start. 
I've got lost family members. I've got lost loved ones. I've got lost friends who need to see Jesus in me. And I, I, don't, I don't live it. God, I come and I repent before you. God, I'm willing to be obedient to the call that you've laid on my life. I've skirted it so many times. Is that you? Do you really want to see revival? You see, revival starts when you're willing to, to move and listen to God and call out to Him. Remember who He is. Remember what He's done. And then allow Him to change you. Don't walk away today the same that you were when you got here. God desires so much more in your life. There's so many people that He wants to reach through you. Are you willing to give Him that opportunity? Will you come, church? Will you come? If you don't know Jesus, you want to know Him, come. I'll tell you. I'll share. Take God's Word. I'll point you to Him. You can have personal repentance. You can have revival start because you can come to know Jesus for the first time. Your name could be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Will you come? Will you be obedient? Will you do business with God today? Because He desires to do business with you. Are we tired of playing games? See, when we start living for Jesus in front of people, when God see, when people see the change in us, it's amazing. It is amazing the change that happens in them. Why? Because you've experienced revival and now they can. Is that you? church Jesus died for you he loves you and he wants to use you in a powerful way to reach lost people he just wants us to be pliable he just wants us to be moldable he just wants us to be makeable he wants to change us you see I can make a change but guess what I'll change back but when God makes a change it's forever changed and when revival starts in us then revival can escalate beyond us to our community to our county, to our state, to our nation, and to our world. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for hearing our prayers today. Lord, I thank you that you love us and that you care for us and that you call us to repentance, God. I thank you that you desire revival in the heart of your church and in the life of your church. God, that there's people who look at our lives every day and they want to see, is this Jesus real? Is he the real deal? We, we talk about it, but maybe we don't live it. And so, Father, for, for everyone who's cried out, either by making a choice to come forward or even in their seat to say, Lord, I repent. God, I want revival. God, I want you to change me. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would change us from the inside out. And God, if there's any who have called on you as a lost person, your word says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I know that you are faithful to bring about salvation if we just cry out to you. So, Lord, I pray today, I pray, God, that, that you'll hear our prayers, that you'll answer our prayers, just as you heard Jonah's prayer in the belly of a fish, right smack dab in the middle of the ocean, out of your will, all messed up, doing his own thing. God, you heard his prayer, and you saw repentance, and you reclaimed your message through him, and you brought revival to him, and you brought revival to Nineveh. God, will you bring revival to your church? And will you allow us to take revival to others? Thank you for loving us, Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that you went to an old rugged cross to pay our sin debt, and that you didn't stay dead, no. You rose again on the third day so that we could have life forevermore. Thank you for that. Thank you for that hope. God, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for providing for us. I pray, Lord, that you've heard your people and that you work in your people. Continue to work in and through us, Jesus, to reach a lost and dying world. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.